everyone. Um, yeah, thanks to it's nice that uh, for inviting me along tonight. Um, as Liv said, I'm Danielle Pender. I'm the founder and editor of Repost Magazine, Clicker. Yes. Um, so tonight I'm just going to talk about where the idea came from, how it developed, how the idea, um, the ethos behind the magazine influenced the design and some of the challenges that we faced starting up the magazine. I've mentioned magazines a lot in there in that intro. Um, so one of the earliest influences was the fact that I was a teenager in the 90s and um, the women of my teenage years were badass. They didn't have um, a team of stylists behind them. They wrote and played their own music. Um, they didn't spout off about Simon Fuller's like girl power marketing speak. They were women like Kim and Kelly Deal of the Breeders, um, Kim Gordon of Sonic Youth, Patty Shemo, Courtney Love, and Melissa Altamauer of Hole, PJ Harvey, Gwen Stefani, and Bjork, and many others, SWV. Jade, anyway, um, these women heavily influenced my outlook and attitude and one of the starting points for the magazine was the fact that I didn't really relate to a lot of the women that I saw in the media, um, the sort of guts and rawness of these women had been replaced by some boobs and artifice and I didn't think that the magazines the, that were on offer to women were particularly great either so I've just pulled together a random selection of covers to see what we're dealing with. So there's the classic fatty versus skinny um, and none of them come off very well so you're kind of screwed whether you're fat or thin and to be honest the people that they say are fat just kind of look normal so it's a bit degrading. Um, Posh is pregnant but she's worried about being fat but then she's so stressed about being fat she lost some weight so that kind of cancels it out. <laughs> these girls have gone out without any makeup on which is mental <laughs> and then these girls need to wear more makeup because their skin is terrible which is obviously not good. And then good old Grazia loves a star in crisis so Angelina's in a jealous rage about something, um, Jennifer Aniston is a wreck. Madonna's in some sort of crisis and they're kind of reveling in uh, Rihanna's mistake, whatever that was. Um, and yeah, it's this kind of um, negative language and sort of bitchy commentary and um, comparing one woman's life against another, which I don't think is very helpful and I don't think it has to be like that. And even the sort of more um, reputable magazines, they portray a vision of womanhood which is really unrealistic so the women in these photographs don't look like that. Adele has like miraculously lost about five stone. <laughs> Helena Bonham Carter has lost about 20 years. Kylie lost a foot and she kind of looks weirdly <laughs> like to Lisa which is odd and then Kate Winslet seems like she's been transported back to the 70s and looks like Jerry Hall like I'm not quite sure what's going on with that one. Um, so yeah, there's obviously the argument that these magazines sell and they wouldn't sell if people didn't want to read about this kind of stuff, but I think, and I'm not saying it's wrong to buy these magazines or to read them, but I think that when this is the only thing that's on offer, it's a bit of a problem. So I looked at, the, oh that was really loud, um, I looked at the kind of magazines that I was buying and um, they were more male oriented magazines like Monocle, Port, um, Modern Matter, or oh, whoops, um, or more culture, um, art and design based magazines like Apartmento, some rag called Printed Pages, um, The Gourmand, and um, yeah these are really beautiful magazines and their design and production qualities are really high um, and the reason I bought them mainly was because the, the broad, um, they offered a broader range of topics than the usual like fashion, beauty, relationships, celebrities that the makeup stories about. Um, and I thought there was a gap in the market for something that was a bit smarter and better designed. There's obviously The Gentlewoman, which I think um, the latest issue looks incredible, but that's only one against like the raft, a raft of the usual suspects. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So I saw a photograph um, of Kate Blanchett on Intelligent Life, and I thought she looked... I was quite startled when I first saw it, because you can see shadows under her eyes, um, she's got lines by her mouth, but I think she looks really amazing. She just looks like natural and that's how she looks. She's 44, she looks like 44 year old woman, possibly better than most. Um, 
But I thought it was really interesting because you never normally see women of that stature looking like that unless they kind of got like a heat ring of shame around the fact that they've got no makeup on and they look minging. Um, what was I going to say next? Yeah, so I thought there was basically a gap in the market um, and had all of this sort of mulling over in my head and decided that I would start thinking about um, starting a women's magazine, which was smarter and celebrated women um, for their achievements rather than what they looked like. Um, and so in the early stages, um, we played around with the idea of coming up with um, a magazine app, but I spoke to some people who work in um, uh, established magazines and they were sort of saying the amount of money that they spent on developing an app versus how, much, how many people downloaded it, it just, they didn't see the benefit in it. So we didn't kind of go for that. Um, and we've had a really great response to the magazine so far, but I don't think that would have happened if it wasn't a print product. Um, I think there's the tactile nature of print, which you, it's impossible to reproduce in a digital format. And I think that's where independent um, publishers really excel the amount of... Um, care and attention to detail that goes into some of the magazines that I just mentioned. <coughs> um, it's phenomenal and I think if you're going to commit something to print um, it has to be really good because of the uh, cost and the effort it takes to make a magazine and I think readers um, really relate to that and they really respond to it. And also um, in an increasing digital age I think there's a real demand for pastimes that kind of take you away from staring at screen. So, and also, yeah, if Tyler Brule isn't doing it, then we're not doing it, because he's a smart guy. Um, so with the formats, we decided to have a magazine, um, and we, did, uh, we came up with the concept of five ideas, four interviews, three features, two essays, and one question. But I asked a bunch of women that one question, and nobody responded, so it was either a really terrible question, or that it just wasn't quite the right format. So we decided to change it to one icon. Um, and we asked um, Shaniqua Jarvis, who is a New York-based photographer, who her icon was. Um, and she picked Carrie Mae Weems, who I'd never heard of, but she's an amazing African-American photographer. Um, and that's been one of the really nice things about working on the magazine, is finding out about all these women that I'd never heard of before. Um, so with we had the format, it was going to be a printed um, product, and then I started thinking about a name and I had a really bad, long list of terrible, terrible, stinky names, um, which I was going to put in the presentation, but they're too embarrassing. Um, yeah, I knew it didn't, I didn't want to um, explicitly reference women or feminism. Um, I wanted something that was quite bold in sentiment and that also looked quite bold on the page. Um, and Riposte kind of finally came, by, um, came around because it's um, a Riposte to what's on offer um, and it also references the women in the magazine, they're sort of given their Riposte. Um, so yeah, thinking about the concept and the approach, um, we started early on thinking about what the magazine stood for um, and we decided it was about, we wanted it to be um, honest, smart, celebratory, but we didn't want to take ourselves too seriously. Um, and in terms of being honest and upfront, um, I kind of, I, I really understand that people, everyday life's bullshit and people buy into magazines and films and music because they want escapism, but I think um, that a magazine can still look and feel beautiful um, and we wanted Riposte to be more inspirational rather than aspirational. Um, and sort of fake and unrealistic and unattainable. Um, so the photography that we use is, um, it's unphotoshopped, we don't work with outside stylists, um, there's no fancy lighting. And I really love this, um, these photographs of Francoise Mouly, who is the art editor of The New Yorker, and they were shot by Anthony Crook um, in her studio in Soho, which looks pretty incredible. Um, and I think she looks really brilliant and I think you can take a beautiful photograph of an older woman without patronising her or, um, or photoshopping her or trying to make her look 20 years younger. I think it doesn't have to be like that. Um, so yeah, one of the main concerns was that although it was going to be more challenging content, we didn't want to take ourselves too seriously or feel too worthy. And this quote by S. Devlin, which we put at the end of the magazine, kind of sums it up. Um, yeah, if you can't have a laugh at yourself, then you're pretty fucked. 
So we call ourselves a smart magazine, but smart to us is more of an idea. Um, it's about, yeah, we feature women who are street smart and business savvy, um, women who have carved a career out for themselves um, across a range of different disciplines. And, and in all of the content, we try and celebrate women for who they are and what they've achieved rather than what they look like. Um, Nelly Ben Hayoun, I don't know whether you know her, but um, she's a big fan of the jumpsuit. Um, she's incredible and she managed to like blag her way into NASA and direct a space orchestra. She's been to CERN, she's making a film which I have no doubt in my mind that she will achieve. Um, uh, yeah, everybody should know about Nelly even though she has this crazy French accent. Um, and then Francoise, who I mentioned before, she is the editor of The New Yorker. She was, um, she's from Paris, she was a plumber and an architect and now, um, and then she moved to New York, she bought a printing press and she became um, an authority on graphic art and when Tina Brown took over The New Yorker, she hired Francoise and now she um, commissions culturally relevant uh, covers for one of the world's most famous uh, magazines every week. Mm, click, there you go. Um, and for our second issue, um, we've just done an interview today actually with um, the Nigerian based writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, um, whose uh, book Half of the Yellow Sun has just been made into a film, and she was also um, referenced in one of Beyonce's songs. Um, her TED talk is incredible, and her calm and collect, uh, considered lectures and writing about um, race and gender relations should literally be made part of the curriculum. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the design now <coughs> and how the ethos behind the magazine influenced it. I work with Shaz Madani, who's over there. Uh, she's our creative director and she did um, a fantastic job of turning my ideas um, and developing the idea with me and making it into um, what it is. So the um, yeah, the logo is a slightly altered version of Amerigo. Uh, the pointed and angle serifs reflect the swift, smart tone um, of riposte, and the tapered strokes and curves add um, an elegance and femininity. Um, and it was this focus on what women had to say rather than what they look like, um, which influenced the, influenced the front cover of the magazine, and it pulled um, together some options from early presentations that Shaz did. So we had, we spent ages, probably way too long, um, debating which cover to go for. So we had multi-image covers, another one, large format photographs, colour, there's always going to be, I think, always going to be an image on the back. But they were kind of, and as, as lovely as they were, they weren't, you'd kind of seen them all before. Um, and when Shaz did a nice Photoshop job <laughs> on her carpet, um, of the options next to the uh, other magazines that were out at the time, um, yeah, they kind of, they, yeah, they just weren't as exciting. But then she came up with uh, the text-based cover, um, and when she came up with that one, it was very, um, it was quite risky. It made us a bit nervous because obviously images sell, and why would you not? Why would you take away one of the most given sort of um, hooks? visual hooks, but then it was that risk that, um, that made it more exciting and she um, had this National Geographic magazine which sort of influenced the design and it's really startling in its sort of boldness and simplicity. Um, yeah, and it was this sort of shift in the focus away from what the women looked like to more about um, what, who, what they were, what sorry, what they had to say and who they were, and this is what we ended up with, which we're really happy with. So we have, yeah, we've got the five definitive sections, um, but we didn't feel the need to differentiate each, each chapter with graphics. Um, we've done that with um, different paper stocks, so the meetings are all on a gloss paper, which Mark at Park helped sort out. It's not there. Um, and just from what Bruno was saying before about long copy, all of our um, interviews and features and essays are all quite long, so we wanted something in the middle that um, split it up. So Charles came up with this idea of having an insert 
And we featured the work of Linda, um, who's quite an influential artist who um, did work, early work with the Buzzcocks. Uh, she's busy mates with Morrissey. She's, yeah, she had a big show in Paris um, and still very influential today. And just thinking about the design in terms of not taking ourselves too seriously, um, with the longer essay pieces, we kind of introduced some illustration. So uh, we worked with Hello Vaughan, um, and he did these portraits of these different women who um, program and curate some of the arts organisations around the UK. And just thinking about one of the challenges that we had, we didn't have any money, so this was actually a solution because we didn't have the money to pay for a photographer to go around and shoot portraits of all of the women. So um, I think Vaughan did a brilliant job of... of um, drawn some paint and some really beautiful portraits and it was actually quite a nice happy accident that we were skint. Um, and then Stephanie von Reitzwitz who's in Lagun, she, um, she drew portraits of Ada Lovelace who's Byron's daughter and a really early um, computer programmer and also this was a piece which featured uh, Grace Hopper, she did a portrait of her as well. Um, yeah, and I just thought I would kind of touch on the fact that we use an image on the back of the magazine, so apparently we've lost really valuable ad space. Um, but if on your first foray into publishing you can't play around with the, um, with the format, then when, when can you? And to be honest, nobody was going to buy that back page, so it's no big deal. Um, and I think, yeah, that's the kind of beauty of independent publishing. Why not put a, a photograph? Oh, sorry, I've missed out a big section of my presentation. <laughs> this is more about Shaz's beautiful design and the thought of um, no, no stylistic tricks, and it all lets the content speak for itself. It's a bit embarrassing. Um, yeah, why not put a photograph of an office in NASA where there should be some ads um, because you haven't got any stakeholders telling you to put some ghastly brand on there that you would never wear yourself, so... And I think advertising is quite a tricky one. When you start off your own magazine, do you spend weeks trying to speak to brand managers who have no idea who you are and they don't want to speak to you anyway? Um, or do you spend it developing your content? And to be honest, I'd rather spend it developing the content and if it's good enough, then I think naturally um, the right partnerships should come along. This is the other uh, NASA office. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to wrap up. We're kind of currently working on our second issue, which we're really excited about. Um, we feature some really inspiring women, um, f photographers from Bogota, publishers from the Middle East, a writer from Africa, a rapper from Minnesota and a new band from London, amongst many other amazing women. Um, starting up a magazine hasn't been an easy undertaking. I'm way poorer in terms of time and money. I'm quite inherently lazy person, um, so I haven't watched TV for quite a while, which is gutting. Um, and I think you have to be really careful about your business model from the start. You have to kind of think long term, um, how is it going to be sustainable in terms of time and money? Are you going to, is it realistic to expect to earn money from um, a print product alone? But I don't buy the argument that print is dead. Um, I think it's a really exciting time for print. Um, and, you know, I think. People haven't been making money in the music industry for a long time. They make money elsewhere, kind of add-ons, um, and nobody's bemoaning the death of the music industry. So I think the trick is working out what your other sources of um, revenue are around that. And it was like um, what you were talking about with Wired and the way uh, Vice kind of makes money through other means, not just a print product. Um, but I think with the amount of independent publishers that there are at the minute, there's an opportunity to create something that makes it maybe it's easier, whether that's a sort of media company that specialises in selling adverts for um, independent publishers or new peer-to-peer -peer distribution models. Or it would be amazing if someone at one of the big um, high street chains got a clue about magazines and didn't just stock all the regular rubbish stuff. Um, so yeah, aside from that, I think um, there's a lot to be said for pr uh, producing your own magazine. Um, you've got freedom to decide what you put in it, what your message is, and I think larger magazines might have bigger budgets and access to bigger stars, but I don't think that necessarily makes them better. I think, in some respects, it makes them worse because they don't have to be as creative. Um, 
So yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to developing Repost um, over the next few years. If for nothing else, I can show my nieces that it's not, it's more about what you have to say and what you do than what you look like. Thank you very much. Thank you.